Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Today we're talking with uh, George F. Will about his latest collection of essays, American Happiness and Discontents, The Unruly Torrent, 2008 to 2020, and also about his magnum opus, uh, The Conservative Sensibility. George Will has been one of America's leading columnists since 1974, earning the Pulitzer Prize for commentary, and the Wall Street Journal has called him perhaps the most powerful journalist in America. Joining me in the conversation are two of my frequent guests and longtime followers and fans of George's work, John Tamney, Vice President of Freedom Works, editor of Real Clear Markets, and author of When Politicians Panicked. And Don Bedreau, Professor Don Bedreau, Professor of Economics at George Mason University and Research Scholar at Mercatus Center, who runs the go-to blog for free market economic thinking, Cafe Hayek. George, we don't want to gang up on you, but we are. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have a lot in a friendly way. We have a lot of questions about what you think, what you think is going on today in America. And I guess I'll, I'll take the first question. We've, we've, you write extensively and wonderfully about liberty and the American Constitution and the founding principles, and of course, one of the most essential ones is liberty. And we have lost an awful lot of liberty in the last two years because of the, well, because of the pandemic and also the government's overreaction to the pandemic. When does this end? It ends when the people spontaneously, to use a word of which we're all fond, the spontaneous <laughs> order of a free society, it ends when the people spontaneously do what they're now in the early process of doing, I think, which is withdrawing consent from government by dictates. Uh, there's a sense in politics, there are occasions when worse is better, that it dramatizes certain uh, pathologies of government. You know, the German communists, when it became clear that Hitler was coming to power, said, "Now Hitler kommen wir. We come after Hitler. They were good Marxists. They believed that Hitler would simply deepen the contradictions of capitalism, et cetera, et cetera, and they'd come next. I don't want to associate with a German communist, but... Uh, after the pandemic, libertarians are going to have a good day because people have had a taste of what it looks like when government, in the name of an emergency, exercises powers which it is predictable they will not want to relinquish after the so-called emergency. Which brings up the, the question that I've asked Don, I've asked Bill, and I've asked so many libertarians. Why do you think so many libertarians sat this out completely. I've never seen such quietude on the part of many libertarians about this. They said nothing. And I would love to know what you think. I think they said nothing at the beginning because we were all in a fog of uncertainty about the nature of, of the virus. Uh, at which point it seemed reckless to object. Uh, then people began to think and, and thinking usually helps libertarians. And what people began to think was, uh, is, is, is this, there's something disproportionate and indiscriminate. I think all errors in ethics and politics are at bottom disproportionate measures. And they began to say, okay, what do we know? And we began to learn things, and we learned who is most threatened by the virus, what, what age cohorts, what comorbidities uh, exacerbate this, and we began to make distinctions. That's what thinking is. And the, the distinction, as the distinctions got made, it became clear that the government wasn't making them, and probably not making them for a reason, that government had an incentive. Uh, with Don here, I will now swoop into public choice theory. Good. That uh, <laughs> uh, public choice theory says simply that uh, people in public life are not different than people in the private sector. In the private sector, people try to maximize profits. In government, they try to maximize power. 
and uh, that's what was that's what's been going on here from the start. So I think I can infer from what you just said the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and I'm not going to ask it in a rhetorical way. Were you surprised by what governments did in response to the pandemic? No, because uh, the CDC to begin with was uh, uh, not as competent as we would like. Mm -hmm. John here has uh, often made the point that if the people in government were as smart as they think they are, they'd be in the private sector making more money. Uh, and so if you assume that we don't have the cream of the crop in government, mm -hmm. uh, you can be sure that A, they're going to make mistakes, and that they're, the, they're in it for the psychological rewards of bossing people around. You know, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. These people say, I boss people around, therefore I am. It gives them a sense of, of uh, life and identity. Well, that makes public choice theory even worse then, because you're not only getting the, uh, you, essentially you're saying that you end up in, in, in the bureaucracies the least and the dimmest. Um, rather than the best and the brightest. <laughs> and I, I won an argument, with, not an argument, but a debate with my doctor yesterday. He was very progressive, locked down, got to have government ruled down. I said, look, you went to medical school. Yeah. You graduated near the top of your class. Yeah. Where did the guy go who graduated near the bottom of the class? Oh, that's right. He went to the Maryland Department of uh, <laughs> Health. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so you get this selection of people, and your point about risk-taking and personality, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I would suggest there's a codicil or an exemption to John's theory, and I think, for example, judges could make more money, a lot of them, uh, in the private sector. But it, judging's really a different vocation. It's a calling more. It, it is a calling, and uh, therefore you get uh, judges are, I think, on balance uh, better they're at the far end of the bell curve. I do think there's some things that public choice can't quite explain in this pandemic, and it's a, it's a good thing. I, my sense is that the teachers unions, for example, are way overplaying their hands. Uh, I think a silver lining around this pandemic might be that parents are now seeing what government schooling is about, and, and if they do, they're going to push back against it, and hopefully that will drain a lot of power and influence from the, from the K-12 through public school bureaucracy, including the teachers' unions. The head of the teachers' union in the Los Angeles Unified School District said, A, you can recall the governor, but you can't recall me, and B, you say your children haven't been learning the multiplication tables, but they've learned the meaning of the, of the word resistance and rebellion. Well, parents are not fools. They hear this and they say, well, I'd rather, I think that rather they learn the multiplication tables. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what I mean by overplaying their hands. Exactly. It's, kind of a, it's, it's this an astonishing is, thing to admit publicly. This is the worse is better. Yeah, yeah. Example. yeah. Now, yeah. About halfway through American happiness, um, there's just a lot of good statistics. 37% of American deaths in 1900 came from infectious diseases, and that number is down to 2%. Pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic. Yeah. And you make the point that lifestyle nowadays is the primary killer. It struck me that you were making a broader point in this curation that, and maybe I'm thinking my own thoughts, but that economic growth is the biggest enemy of death and disease that the world has ever known. And then I go to conservative sensibility, you mm -hmm. point out in that, that in the 1950s, bed linens were the biggest line item in hospitals. <laughs> and nowadays, there's all these advances. Uh, it just raises my obvious question. Witnessing the lockdowns, I'm assuming your thought was, what an odd way to fight a, fight a virus. Exactly. Uh, unquestionably, economic growth is a cure for poverty, and poverty is a public health threat. People don't eat well. They don't acquire information. Uh, a middle-class information-acquiring society is apt to be a healthier society. When I went to college, <clears throat> get matriculated in 1958 at Trinity College. The first thing that happened was there's a knock on my door as I'm unpacking. This is four months after my 17th birthday. And there was an upperclassman paid by the tobacco companies to hand out little five packs of cigarettes uh, on the sound assumption that you could get addicted, which I promptly did because <laughs> cigarette smoking then was considered uh, 
the opposite of what it is now, declasse, with sophistication. Uh, one of the greatest achievements of government, more bang for the buck, is the dissemination of public health information, smoking, seatbelt use, things of this sort. It's cheap and it's effective. So some of the people that I've been following, I just learned about since the pandemic began, are some public health experts, and their concern is that the overreaction to COVID has done enormous damage to the public health establishment, dramatically reduced its, its, its stature, and they were very worried about that. Well, what stature should they have? They should have their earned stature. Yeah. yeah. And th this is what we're learning, in fact, is that some of these people haven't earned it. Right, right. But, but, but you're referring to, I'm, I, I assume, you know. The, the, I, think, I, I think the word I'd use is trust. Trust, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I remember as a child the anti-smoking campaign in the United States, and it worked very well. My own, my own 24-year-old son, when I tell him that I can remember people smoking in an airplane, he thinks I'm lying. You know, it just can't <laughs> yeah. be. Right? No one ever smoked in an airplane. Yeah, yeah they did. Um, that was beautiful. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, when I got to college, half the American adults woke up in the morning and lit a cigarette. Yeah. And now, st a quarter still do. I mean, think about that. But it's still a dramatic. No oh, one smokes course. in public it's anymore. And, and, it, and this is a result, as you point out, I think, of, of a, a, a sort of public health push that had enormous yeah. success. And so whatever that establishment is. I'm not celebrating a withdrawal of trust. I think Frank Fukuyama is right that... that uh, prosperous and free society depends on trust. I agree. Capitalism depends yeah. on trust. Yeah. Contracts, promise keeping, uh, honesty as opposed to fraud and advertising and all the rest. So I'm not celebrating that. I am saying that <clears throat> there are times when you need to recalibrate the trust mm -hmm. in particular segments of society. And I think that that the Centers for Disease Control has earned scrutiny. Oh, and absolutely. It's not going to survive it uh, in one piece. Absolutely. And, oh. that's, and that's what these public health experts that I've been speaking to, the ones who I now admire, that's what they regret. They regret the fact that, that the CDC has, has uh, uh, right. acted in a way that lost trust, that, that, that caused people to strip trust from it. Well, a lot, can I have one more question about this? Because some of your stuff on Vietnam in, in this one is just spectacular. And you this make one the, meaning the most in, recent in book, American which is happiness. the collection of essays. Yeah, just yeah. The yeah. Vietnam stuff is so amazing and sad. And you make the point that pre-Vietnam, 1964, trust in the U.S. and government, polling data, 80%. Mm -hmm. It's never come close to that. Trust to do the right thing most of the time yeah, is the question. Yeah, this belief in it. What's your sense of the result of all this the last two years? Is this another Vietnam for government? Where, where do you think this comes out? That's a good question. Uh, the lesson of government most of the time is the deficit we have in, in epistemic humility. What Hayek taught us all the time is you don't know as much as you think you know, that knowledge is dispersed, that markets aggregate it, governments can't, et cetera, et cetera. Vietnam was a lesson in epistemic humility. We, do, we knew next to nothing about a society that we plunged into and we're going to remake. Uh, the Vietnam syndrome lasted for a while. It was an inoculation, if you will, against epistemic humility, and then the vaccination wore off and we went to Iraq. Mm -hmm. So these th nothing lasts, not even vaccinations, as we're now learning. Mm -hmm. But more and more, if you, if you view the world through the, the prism of epistemic humility, you'll see that so many of our problems go back to assuming we know things we don't and can't know. Mm -hmm. This is the Bill Walton Show. We are talking with George Will. His most recent book is American Happiness and Discontents with Don Bedreau and John Tamney. And, and I think the topic at hand is public trust, and public trust in the health establishment. But let me morph a little bit towards all institutions, because you write so well about the battle between the progressive left. You know, Woodrow Wilson was probably, what do you call it, the Wilsonian versus the Madisonian views of the world. And it seems like all the institutions have been captured by the progressives. The Wilsonians seem to be ascendant, and they're ascendant in a public health establishment. And so if you had a more libertarian view, people who, who had that view in those institutions, we would have had a different outcome, I think. Progressivism's long march through the institutions has been right. fast. Yeah. 
century long, but still that's fast, and amazingly successful. And it's partly amazing because the progressives have been so forthright about what they want. Yeah. Woodrow Wilson was the first true progressive president and the first American president to criticize the American founding, which he did not do peripherally. He did it root and branch. He said the constitutional structure is all wrong. Separation of powers was a luxury we could afford back when there were 4 million of us living within 80% of us within 20 miles of Atlantic tidewater, but now we're a continental nation. Complicated, and, and this is the great progressive non sequitur, is that the more complicated society gets, the more ambitious government must be in its interventions. Of course, it's exactly the reverse. The more complicated society gets, the more government ought to flinch from messing with it because the government can't understand that government is like a Calder mobile. You touch something here and way over there things start to jiggle. Hence the law of unintended consequences. I, f I fully agree. One, one of my favorite essays by, by, by Hayek, who's, who's been mentioned here, was a 1976 essay called The New Confusion About Planning, which addressed this very issue. And the new confusion is that, well, as, as society gets more complex, we're more in need of planning. And Hayek said, no, 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 so you have it backwards. The, the more complex society becomes, the less ability there is to plan. Precisely. It, it seems, though, that we're really, we need to reverse, we need to stop the lockdowns. We need to regain our freedom. We need to get back to regular lives and owning our own selves. But how do we reverse the, the takeover if it's possible, of all the institutions, is that of just? Uh, you're, I'm, I'm afraid your 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 most current book is very optimistic about a lot of things. The conservative sensibility is less optimistic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> looking on the bright side, as I am disinclined to do, <laughs> so um, am I. I think <laughs> Margaret Thatcher said, first you win the argument, then you win the vote." Yeah, the elections matter; they really do. Uh, even with the deep state and even with the entrenchment of, of progressivism at the point of levels of government, win the argument. And the argument's winnable. Uh, so uh, that's, the, that's the point. Well, right? is, is, is there a bullish quality to all this? Um, Fred Smith, the founder of FedEx, did not choose academia. He chose to change the world. Uh, progressives choose academia. Is, that, is there something to that, that some of our best people chose to avoid this altogether? You chose a life of business, and thank goodness you did. And Fred Smith was told by the academics yeah. that, around him that his idea was nuts, mm -hmm. that FedEx wouldn't work. Did so he, he get a C-minus on his paper? Right, yes. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> again, the, the market is working to this extent with academia. The prestige of academia is gone. Mm -hmm. When I came to Washington in the 1970s, at the end of the 1960s, the 1960s had been academia's moment in Washington. Schlesinger, Galbraith, the Rostow brothers, the Bundy brothers. Uh, it was considered an ornament to a society to have big name professors come into your administration. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, academia has... has, has by its ridiculousness. And again, there, there are just occasions when worse is better. Uh, when the Secretary of Health and Human Services, goaded by a Republican senator in a public hearing, will not say the word mother, <laughs> insists on saying no birthing people, that's good, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Get, give, him more, give him more time, give him another five minutes mm -hmm. to, to be foolish like that. Mm -hmm. From what, you know, we talk about the March of the Institutions from my world, um, woke corporations, thoughts? Well, what, what they, it's, they, they are facilitating a multi-billion dollar industry. If you think I'm exaggerating, the, the chief diversity officer at the University of Michigan, a public university, is paid more than $450,000 plus yeah. benefits per year. So this is a multi-billion dollar industry, and it's, Painless for corporations. Uh, all their HR people, all the human resources people who are not there because they know how to add value, they're there to sell, satisfy various federal laws and, and various constituencies. They make their money by pandering to this. They spend billions of dollars. It doesn't come out of their own pockets. And they have seminars about uh, privilege without endangering any of their privileges. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a pain-free for them, pain-free, cost-free, virtue signaling. 
But it, at the it's, it, at my hope again, I, I hate to sound optimistic, but but you uh, should we count on we count on the, John for that. The, he'll, the American, he'll welcome. Uh, the, there's a wonderful <laughs> human capacity for boredom, and and uh, this is excruciatingly boring. All this stuff about the, the, the Babylon Bee, that wonderful satirical yeah. sentence that we are running out of things to call racist. Uh, <laughs> we just are, and. Uh, when we reach the end of this, the boredom will set in. Well, I'm already there with that. Yeah. What do you think? Well, well the, the, George's earlier remark, it's the best reason I've had to feel optimistic in, in two years, the, the notion that the hand has been overplayed and people are just seeing the absurdity for what it is, absurdity. Mm -hmm. Well, what about also just changes in the world we live in? I, I thought one of the happiest stories in, in American happiness began horribly. It's about that book, America 1908, that you wrote about, about the, the one of the, there was a mass lynching in uh, Springfield, Illinois in 1908. It was just tragic, the, the way you described it. But then you point out in 2007, so nearly 100 years later, a black man, Barack Obama, announces his run for presidency in that same city. And I took it as your way of saying, things do get better. Uh, we are oh. a society of people. We just can't help but improve. And look at how the U.S. has changed in 100 years. Look at a, look at a s Southeastern Conference football game. That's as close to an established yes. religion as we have in the United States. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you go to, to a Mississippi-Alabama football game, the head referee is apt to be an African-American. He's bossing everyone around. He's penalizing them. And no one thinks a thing about it. The amazing progress in this country is so astonishing that, that this is why the Black Lives Matter and, and its attendant satellite groups uh, have to be so shrill because they are denying what is obvious to everybody. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the, uh, one of the things that we, you write in your book, and I guess it's a uh, conservative sensibility, is the family. And there's a movement, and this is a larger question here, about the progressive left versus the, I don't know what we would call the, the, and, the Orrin Cass right. The because National Economic Conservatives. National Economic Conservatives. That was your, your you, had a, you had a question about that. I mean, we're, how, which, which is worse? Yeah, which is worse? So today we have the progressive left, you know, Elizabeth Warrens, the AOCs. On the other side, we have people like Orrin Cass, the, the, the Henry Olson, who writes for the Washington Post, the national conservatives. They both seem pretty threatening to me. Do you have an assessment of which is worse? Yeah, the uh, progressives, because uh, the national conservatives are progressivism light. Yeah. And uh, it's just a low-calorie version, which ultimately won't be very satisfying any more than light beer is. Uh, I... I I, I tend to think that uh, the American people learn by fits and starts and slowly, but they learn because they don't learn fast because they're not watching television and they're not reading news. Most Americans don't read newspapers. Most people who read newspapers don't read the op-ed pages where people like me appear. Uh, there are 331 million people in this country, and at any given moment, 320 million, 25 million of them are not watching cable television, not listening to talk radio, listening to this podcast, I presume. But uh, the American people are busy raising children and fixing the screen door and getting on with life, and that's the sign of a healthy society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, along those lines of the national conservatism, I thought I'd love the statistic in American happiness about Pittsburgh, that 100 years ago it was the ninth largest city in the U.S. in terms of population. And it's not anymore. I think, it's, I think you say it's 63rd now. Uh, the talent has left Pittsburgh. Maybe it's coming back. But I think it, I took it. I it's saw, different kind of talent. I, different yeah. kind of talent, but I took it as something I wanted to see is that Pittsburgh is a repudiation of national conservatism, this idea that we need to preserve the past economically. Pittsburgh is a bright, shining bit of evidence that when you preserve the past, you drive away the talent that attracts the investment. When I was a child in the early 50s, 
we would drive from central Illinois, where I live, to visit my grandfather, who was a Lutheran minister in Denora, Pennsylvania, in the Monongahela Valley, which is ground zero for the obliteration of the American steel industry. Mm -hmm. And we'd drive into Pittsburgh, which was then known as hell with the lid off. We'd drive, <laughs> drive in, and it, it was glowing at night from the, the molten slag poured there. Well, that's gone. Uh, today, the largest employer in Pittsburgh, as in Cleveland, as in uh, Houston, is healthcare. In Pittsburgh, largely because of the University of Pittsburgh's medical center. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, these cities have reinvented themselves precisely because they're not listening to the national conservatives who, in some demented way, believe that Donora, Pennsylvania is coming back as a steel town. It's not, and the people at Denora know it. Just try and and they're tell, glad it's not. Hey, precisely, tell, yeah, they tell, desperately a, do not want it to come back. Exactly. This is the Bill Walton Show. We're George Will and John Tamney and Don Boudreau, and we're uh, we're going after our favorite topic: national conservatives and uh, why we think they're probably heading in the wrong direction. And when they come up with some of one of my favorite national conservative was when they or in, one of his people wrote a long essay about how private equity adds no value. <laughs> and I spent a little time in a private equity business. And I sort of remember we bought these companies and yeah, they were, they were a mess and they didn't always work, but we spent an awful lot of time developing new products, new markets, new services, all sorts of things like that. I thought we were adding value, if but private then I'm informed we were not. If private equity exists, it has value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because exactly. <laughs> otherwise it wouldn't exist. <laughs> I mean, this is really simple stuff. Well, well one thing that they do, they are concerned about, and we're concerned about, and you're concerned about, is family disintegration. I mean, that's gotten worse and worse and worse. And if that, it just seems like the family is a bedrock uh, for a libertarian, free, constitutionally limited governance society. I mean, how do we, how do, we do this without families? There is abundant social science demonstrating that the family, as usual and as always, is the primary transmitter of social capital, by yes. which I mean the attitudes, values, assumptions that make it possible to take advantage of the opportunities of a free society. We know that when you have 69% uh, of African-American children born to unmarried women, we know that when we have, as today, 40% of all first births out of wedlock, we know that when, as today, a majority of women of mothers under 30 are not living with the fathers of their children, think about that, a majority, yeah. we know that you have, have a crisis. When my dear friend Pat Moynihan wrote the famous Moynihan Report, he was a 38-year-old social scientist in Lyndon Johnson's Labor Department, he said, we have a crisis in America because 23.7% of African-American children are born out of wedlock. And he said, with typical Moynihanian flair, he said, the lesson of history is clear from the wild Irish slums of the East Coast in the 19th century to South Los Angeles today, when you have a large cohort of inadequately parented, that is not fathers in the home, adolescent males, you have chaos. Mm. I've raised three male children. I know that the whole point of civilization is to civilize adolescent males. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> and when that doesn't happen, you have, un you have uh, chaotic neighborhoods and schools so busy trying to maintain discipline they cannot teach. Well, to push back on that and your optimism of a moment ago, how do we stop that? Because it seems these statistics are yeah. getting worse. No one has the slightest idea because we don't know what caused it. Yeah. Yeah. It's that simple. In 1950, the out-of-wedlock birth rate... Uh, for whites and blacks was approximately the same. We don't know what caused it. And anyone who says they do is mistaken. Well, are there disinc you know, we all believe that, that incentives matter. Sure. I mean, we build a lot of disincentives into the federal uh, entitlement system, starting with the Great Society. When I say no one knows, I would put an asterisk, because <clears throat> Charles Murray has a lot of ideas about this. Yeah, Charles has been here. He, yeah, sure, when he yeah. wrote the book Losing Ground, he said, look, <clears throat> when you have a stunning correlation, the Great Society welfare programs, the increase in, um, in uh, out-of-wedlock births, it's sensible to look for causation. 
Do you think that economic growth could ever be the solution? Would it cause people to, to this make, problem? Yeah. Would it cause people to make better decisions? Because there's there's an incentive based on the opportunity there to, to do the right thing. It would help, but this is... Uh, is beyond? This is culture. Mm -hmm. This is why what, what happened in the, in the 1960s was so shattering to the confidence of American social policymakers. Mm -hmm. They said economic growth will cure our problems. That's why when Sergeant Shriver was put in charge of Lyndon Johnson's uh, <clears throat> war on poverty it was asked by a congressional committee, how long will it take to end poverty in the country? He said, 10 years. <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> Why? Because he could project economic growth. Mm -hmm. And what happened was Moynihan's scissors, which I write about in, in uh, The Conservative mm -hmm. Sensibility. When you had this divergence, rise, uh, declining adult male minority unemployment and rising welfare cases. Mm -hmm. That was not supposed to be possible, and mm -hmm. it happened. Well, and now we have a, a cabinet that I think Steve Moore was here. He, he reminded me that of all the people in the Biden administration cabinet, the total number of years worked in the private sector totals two. <laughs> I'm surprised it's a whole number. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's Buttigieg at McKinsey. McKinsey doesn't okay, count for the private sector. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Raimondo at... Uh, Commerce worked in the private sector somewhat. Okay, well, well, you know, yeah. it's a good story. I don't yeah. know. I, I it's to, small. That's the I point. You yeah. may have to right. check it. Right. So when we have this, you know, everybody coming out of academia and political activism going into government. How do we reverse what you know? You point out the um, we've got a, a national political culture that really based rewards rent seeking from government, and that mm -hmm. seems to be. You've been very optimistic today, so I'm enjoying your. your I'll, I'll try and correct for that <laughs> in our remaining time. So how, how, do we, how do we? How do we? How do we reverse this? Uh, this deep state, whatever this this corruption is that we're uh, we're, we're seeing here in D.C. Well, <clears throat> I would begin by saying the following: Elizabeth Warren has a firm grip on half a point. <laughs> She looks at the Washington area and she says there's something wrong with the fact that Washington, which has no natural resources, that doesn't manufacture anything but trouble, laws and regulations, that Washington has in its metropolitan area five of the ten by per capita income richest counties in the country. Why? Well, um, as uh, some fellow, I can't remember his name right now, at, at Cato said, uh, when you set out a picnic, you expect to get ants. The federal budget's the biggest picnic in the world. And you draw lobbyists. That is, you draw people who decided, have decided that entrepreneurship is a hard way to make money. The good way to make money is with rent seeking. Mm -hmm. And what you get then is a politics that is increasingly embittered by distributional conflicts, which is what we have today. Uh, and you try to tell the American people, if you're unhappy with the tone of American public life, understand that this is why, because the stakes are unhealthily high of our politics. That if you want to get, get the, the amount of money out of politics, get the amount of politics out of money, out of the distribution of wealth and opportunity. Lower the stakes, you'll lower the temperature. And I think that's an argument we can make. Well, so you've made the argument a lot, and I, I agree with you, that the uh, uh, John McCain approach to curing politics with you know, the, the, the campaign finance reform is completely futile. I assume you still believe that. It's not only futile, it's, it's, it's the worst. Dangerous. The McCain-Feingold is the worst law passed in my 50 years in Washington. Really? Yes, huh. because it said we, elected officials of Congress, have a right to limit the quantity and regulate the quantity, content, and timing of speech about elected officials in Congress, and they got away with it. Now the Supreme Court slowly has chipped away at that, and uh, uh, different technologies have changed the role of money in politics substantially, and we've demonstrated the decline, steeply declining utility of the political dollars. Uh, yeah. I mean, when you have 78,000 poli literally political campaign ads in places like Hamilton County, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Clark County, Nevada. It's just audible wallpaper. No one pays any attention to it. So on page 57, um, 
this is just a write-out, Soviet military brass told Gorbachev they, they could defend the USSR's northern sector without, they could only do it if they tripled spending, and then in your quotes, thus did the Cold War end. And so here's an example of growing government that seemed to have a positive impact, or do you think that eventually the Soviet Union was going to die of its own contradictions? Did we need the big buildup there militarily, or where do you come out on that? Well, I'd, I'm, I'm not a big believer in historical inevitabilities, so I don't want to, which is the language of Marxism, mm -hmm. so I don't want to assault the Marxists with their own categories. Mm -hmm. I do believe that uh, when uh, Reagan said, well, we'll just see if you can compete with us and uh, try a strategic defense initiative. Uh, and by the way, we're going to talk to our friends, the Saudis, and they're going to turn on the oil spigots, and we're going to drive down the cost of oil, price of oil worldwide. And the Soviet Union had then, as Russia has today, a hunter-gatherer economy. They extract eggs from sturgeon and stuff from the ground, and that's it. I mean, name a consumer good from the Soviet Union, anyone, or Russia, anyone would want to buy, can't. Uh, so the, the, this was, yes, it was positive big government that did it. Well, government's supposed to look after our national security. We don't want to privatize the Marine Corps. I'm not that, that severe libertarian. Privatize the Marine Corps. Well, that would, <laughs> I agree. That, we could get the Swiss Guard or something like that, I suppose. They'd be happy to get back. <laughs> uh, right now in Washington, the Democrats are pushing this these, uh, the John Lewis Act to federalize uh, election laws. This seems to be going in exactly the wrong direction. You'd put the entire federal election, app, all the United States election apparatus into the Civil Rights D Division of the Justice Department, which of course was staffed originally by Barack Obama's people, and now, now it's worse. One of the arguments for federalism is uh, if states are making decisions as opposed to the federal government, you don't make a continental mistake every time you act. If you assume, which is safe to do, that most of what government does it shouldn't do or it's going to do it wrong, the argument for federalism is to minimize the continent-wide mistakes. Bringing this to, to voting uh, rights, which are clearly under the Constitution state responsibilities, you have to observe that never in human history, never in American history, has it been easier to vote. We had, more voted. We, had more, we had a higher turnout in the last presidential election exactly. I think, than, than ever. So if maybe 1992 of, was another one. So if that. what these people are worried about is voter suppression, <clears throat> it's really failing because the voters are coming out in droves. It's a non-crisis. But it's treated as a crisis in the mainstream media. They don't hear what you're saying. Let me pick up on that. <laughs> yeah. I want to get into what you think about what's happening with the social media companies because none of us particularly think antitrust is a very good way to go with that. But on the other hand, you do have this incredible lock on speech and the whole debate about the virus, the lockdowns, there's so many things you're not allowed to talk about or you lose your Twitter account. And a lot of the conversation we're having here you can't see on the 6 o'clock news. You can't see it on any of the mainstream outlets. But that's not the fault of social media. Okay, well, let's, let's dig into that because yeah. I want to hear, I want to figure out what we do about that. I'm not the best person to talk about this because I've never tweeted. I don't know how to tweet. I'm told I have a Facebook page, but I've never seen it. I'm just not interested. I, I don't understand the people who say they can't live without it. <laughs> I'm also puzzled by this. The Roman Empire is gone. Carolingian Empire didn't last. Ottoman Empire, Habsburg Empire, British Empire, Soviet Empire. Facebook's forever? I don't think so. This is well, what was it? Just the other day, maybe this morning for all I know, Toyota passes GM as the largest maker of automobiles in the United States. Yeah. I remember when John Kenneth Galbraith in the Affluent Society and elsewhere, the New Industrial State, and I was saying, Absolutely, General Motors is unassailable. It had 48% market share. Today it's, what, 17%. Nothing lasts. That's the first premise of my kind of conservatism. Nothing lasts. Well, you remember the, the Microsoft uh, antitrust suit of, what, 20, 25 years ago, where 
Microsoft, what's, what's their, what's their uh, uh, browser? Is it yeah, uh, they, Windows? Put, they Not have the Windows. temerity to put Internet Explorer, Explorer for free. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and, and, and this, work is, out. This, yeah, this is going to cement them as the, as the biggest uh, consumer electronics company. In the, the 1970s, the Justice Department of the federal government was worried about IBM's monopoly on office typewriters. Remember what a typewriter was? <laughs> I've literally had a student see a picture of a typewriter and didn't know what it was. In, 19, in the late, mid to late 1930s, there was something like, I forgot how many, 18,000 uh, A&P stores, grocery stores. Enormous number. Uh, something like one for every 9,000 Americans. Yeah. Then something, uh, and they got big because they started downtown, which is where people went to shop. Then Piggly Wiggly says, Mm, they're going outside. Let's go where the parking is. And suddenly Piggly Wiggly took over them. Now Amazon is delivering our detergents. Yeah. I mean, nothing lasts. This is the Bill Walton Show, and we're just having the best time with an optimistic George Will. <laughs> it's great. And Don, Don Monroe and John Tamney. And the issues I have with social media companies, he assures me they're going to disappear into the sands of time as have all the other monopolies like A and P and uh, I guess AT and T. Can I give you one other example? One other example. Come on, let's I go. I think it's November two thousand and seven. The cover story in Forbes magazine was: "The cell phone king, one billion customers. Can anyone challenge it?" They were talking about Nokia. Yeah. Five <laughs> months earlier, something called an iPhone had been introduced. Yeah. Nothing less. I think history is pretty strong on can, this. Can we, can we just talk about the year 2000? GE was the most valuable company in the world, $585 billion. Where is it? Enron was the best managed company in the world. <laughs> Tyco was on the cover of Barron's as the next GE. The two most dominant Internet companies, AOL and Yahoo. Where are they today? And remember... AOL and Time Warner, the merger was held up for over a year because the com combination was going to be unassailable once again. Well, and, and uh, that was also uh, high my, my year. Of, that was 2000. Also, Chief Financial Officer magazine had the three highest value-added chief financial officers in the world. And the three companies they were chief financial officers were of was WorldCom, Enron, and Tyco. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I want to I want to respond to this smear that I'm an optimist. <laughs> I, 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 I'm trying to be a little provocative. Yeah. Uh, I want to tell you why I'm why grounds for deep pessimism. I'm an optimist in the sense that uh, the evidence is pouring in on the side of the arguments the four of us make about society. Mm -hmm. uh, the other side doesn't have arguments. They have control of the media, they have censorship, they have cancellations, but they can't argue. Right. Um, so uh, our, our side has the, the mental sinews that have developed over the years and are very strong. Here's what's alarming. In a reasonably educated, temperate, prosperous, middle-class country, 70% of, of the self-identified members of one of our two major parties believes a preposterous lie about the last election, 70 percent. Uh, this, uh, this is the Madisonian grounds for pessimism. Madisonian said, Madison said, majorities are going to rule. You better take a lot of care to make sure that public opinion of these majorities is moderated and refined and filtered and slowed through representative institutions. And the rise of populism which is everything conservatism isn't. The rise of populism, which is anti-Madisonian, is uh, alarming, and I'm not saying irreversible, but it is frightening. Populism on the left or populism on the both, right or both? Both, both. But even there, would, earlier you, you pointed out that Americans just don't bother. They're fixing the screen door. Mm -hmm. they're, they're focused on other stuff. So how deep is that 70% number. I guess that's my, I just don't think Americans are political. I don't think they've ever been. Well, I think the, uh, <clears throat> the political system is an exquisitely sensitive market mechanism in our country. And if 
this were a, a frivolous, shallow, easily evanescent phenomenon, the 70%, you wouldn't have the Republican Party governed by stark terror of its constituents. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to have a political party. And I've, these two political parties have framed our, our competition since 1856. And now one of our two political parties is terrified of its voters. Not all of them. Of course, they're terrified of the intense, compact minority, maybe 30% of, of true believers in the 45th president. But history is made by intense, compact minorities. Well, that is depressing. <laughs> ah, good. I'm we succeeded. Yeah. We, we, yes. we, we got into deep despair here. Not actually. But, I, but, yeah. uh, yeah, but you know, I... The, the Constitution, George, you've written about so well that what's conservatism, it's returning to the founders' Constitution and their view of human nature and, you know, sort of the essential unchanging aspects of human nature, and they put up safeguards to protect people from gaining too much power. Mm -hmm. And the progressives have really done the most to, to break all those barriers down. And the electoral college, you know, the direct election of senators, all the sort of things they've done in the last hundred years have broken all that down. And now, I don't know whether the populism on the right is really that focused on changing the institutional structures as the, as the progressives were. No, the progressives are more serious about government. And that's uh, their business. That's, that's their business. That's their vocation, their calling, yes. The biggest change I've made in my thinking in my 50 years in Washington is my thoughts about the judiciary. When I arrived in 1970, I was filled with, as most conservatives then were, the, the rhetoric of judicial restraint, judicial deference to majoritarian institutions. I believed in what was then called the counter-majoritarian difficulty. Judicial review was inherently suspect because it struck down what majorities did. I have since had an epiphany. Uh, I grew up in central Illinois, Lincoln country, and according to local lore, Lincoln was in the Champaign County Courthouse when he heard that the Kansas-Nebraska Act had been passed in 1854. Lincoln at that time was a prosperous traveling railroad lawyer. The Kansas-Nebraska Act was the effort by uh, Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas to solve the question of should slavery be allowed to expand into the territories? Could slaves be taken there? Would state laws protect them? And all of that. Douglas said, simple answer to that is majority rule, popular sovereignty in the territories. Vote slavery up, vote it down. It's a matter of moral indifference. The morally important point in America is majority rule. Lincoln's ascent to greatness began with his recoil against that. He said, no, America is not about a process majority rule. It's about a conditioned liberty. And that's where we divide today. The progressives rightly, from their point of view, took over the language of judicial deference. They're, they're with Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said, if the American people want to go to hell, I will help them. It's my job. <laughs> that was his understanding. That's an exact quote. His understanding of the judicial function was to get out of the way of majorities. I think the judicial function is to stand in the way of majorities often. So why did so many conservatives in the mid, mid 20th century uh, come to have the position that you once held in, in favor of severe judicial restraint? The war on court, basically. Uh, an overreaction to it? Yes, it was an overreaction to the somewhat freewheeling uh, discovery, not of natural rights, but of rights as progressives understand it, as, mm. as spaces of autonomy granted by majorities through the government. Mm. In uh, the conservative sensibility, you write about Lochner versus <clears throat> the state of New York, and this is, I, I, I will butcher it, but it's the idea the Supreme Court stepped in and said people have an individual right to contract, mm -hmm. uh, that the state of New York could not limit their right to work a certain number of hours per week, I think. And so my question is, I asked a lot of libertarians during the lockdowns, is there a right to contract here? Can government limit the ability of people to go to work and limit the, the right of businesses to open? Do you have an opinion on that? Was it yeah, it depends on the nature of the so-called emergency. That's why 
at the beginning we had to be, it was rational to be sensitive to the problem of a pandemic because a pandemic is a classic example of an, of an other regarding act, to use John Stuart Mill's language from On Liberty. They're self-regarding acts and other regarding acts. If you have a highly contagious, easily transmitted virus, then going to work can be another regarding act and a dangerous one. So you had to get some information, you had to sort it out. And that's when we began to learn that this, this was not that easily transmissible. It was, it's a particular threat to the elderly, not to the young, happily. It was just kind of a, a benevolent <laughs> pandemic, if you will. Uh, so we had to think it through. It was, it, was, it was in the second stage when we began to get information and the information worked against the impulse of the government to expand its control and the government resisted the information. That's when uh, this became a, 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 a tutorial in political life. But wasn't the information the fr people acting freely? I mean, didn't that speak to how dangerous it was to limit freedom at all? Yes, there, there should have been a presumption. There's always should be a presumption against the government limiting freedom. It seems mm -hmm. to me, People say, Will, are you a libertarian? I say, I'm a libertarian-ish, and so are you. Because what a libertarian's going in premise is, before the government limits the freedom of the individual or two or more individuals contracting together, it ought to have a good reason and it ought to say what it is. Mm -hmm. That's it. That, that's it. That, that way, everyone's a libertarian. Mm -hmm. because, and it puts the burden on the government, which is where it belongs. Mm -hmm. I think you overstate the case. I don't think everyone's a libertarian. I think a lot of these progressives. You're right. I they, did overstate. They, they, libertarian, they, uh, the yeah. progressives again. I, pre boss, I boss people around, therefore I am. This yeah. is their. They're improvers. That's their they're presumption. Improvers. They want to. Yeah, make you might be able better. to make a case for freedom, but the burden's on you to make a case for freedom, as opposed to the burden right. being on the right. proponent of government action to make a case for the government action. And the, and to a progressive. The case for freedom is defeated by one of the consequences of freedom, which is inequality. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, the, uh, the, your dissertation was beyond the reach of majorities, closed questions in an open society. So it sounds like you figured that out 50 years ago. I did. Uh, that's a phrase from the uh, West Virginia v. Barnett. In 1939, the Supreme Court, with war clouds lowering over Europe and the opinion written by a refugee, Jewish refugee from Vienna, Felix Frankfurter, affirmed the right of the state of Pennsylvania to require Jehovah's Witnesses' children in the name of national unity uh, to salute the flag, which they considered blasphemous. Just four years later, during wartime, the Supreme Court, to its great credit, uh, struck down a similar law affecting similar children in West Virginia, saying the very purpose of a Bill of Rights is to place certain things beyond the reach of majorities above the vicissitudes of politics. That was written by Justice Robert Jackson, who later was, who previously was Attorney General and later led our delegation at the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials. Well, the, uh, the Bill of Rights, what we've seen in the last... Uh, Two years is most of the aspect, most of the pieces of the Bill of Rights seem to be badly eroded. I mean, you know, movement, speech, um, assembly. Um, you know, where do we? I, I guess I'm coming back to where we started. That, uh, and when you talk about protecting minorities, which I totally agree with, what are the institutional frameworks that allow us to do that if we don't? look at the Constitution as our guide. Well, that's, we're, all of this is downstream from culture. And in American Happiness and Discontents, I tried to put together some thoughts I had on how we began to produce children who, when they get to college, don't say, whoopee, let's exercise free speech. They say, well, no, let's find a safe space where we can cower and hunker down <laughs> while the bias response teams from the administration sweep the campus for offensive speech. How'd this happen? And I think, again, understanding that politics is downstream from culture that has to do with the way we parent nowadays, the way we raise children. We have produced consciously fragile people, people luxuriating in their fragility, 
saying I, I'm so exquisitely sensitive that I must be protected from the sharp edges of reality. Well, we have a gardener, a, a lovely, lovely young woman with this whole pandemic happening. When we go, when we leave the property, she'd say to us, be safe. I know. And I have other plans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, really, if you run your whole life just on being safe, which seems to be the default mode for where we're going, our tolerance for risk is approaching zero. And when that happens, everything shuts down. Yeah. Can we it's just... a, sort of a dysfunctional uh, consequence of the enormous wealth that we have. We get this impression that we can have it all. Life seems so easy. Life today seems so safe. One you know? of the reasons this pandemic has had such a traumatic effect is the same reason the AIDS epidemic did. Mm -hmm. When the AIDS epidemic happened, a, a generation of Americans who came after the Salk vaccine said, oh, well, the Salk vaccine shows how you make great improvements in public health. It's with a technological silver bullet. Mm -hmm. Not true, but they thought that. Mm -hmm. I mean, tuberculosis is a much more telling example. About 2% of the cure of tuberculosis was medicine. 98% was economic growth, economic progress, better hygiene, better housing, better food handling, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the AIDS epidemic shocked people. So we thought we'd got beyond infectious diseases. Well, you know, it took us four years to identify the virus in HIV. It took us, what, six weeks Ooh, this time around right, with, yeah. the, with the, the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Just imagine if it had taken us four years to identify the COVID-19 virus. One last Would topic, and then we've, we've got to get out of here. It's becoming martini hour at, uh, at, uh, at our house. Um, we, uh, China. What's gonna, is China going to go the way of uh, the, the tech monopolies? Are they, are they, have they peaked now? Have they overplayed their hand? Uh, well, I, I think they have overplayed their hand. And... Some small platoons around the world are showing the big platoons how to act. The Women's Tennis Association in the United States has shown the NBA, don't be, you didn't collaborate with these people, stand up and say it. Lithuania. Lithuania, exactly. Has, has, yeah. has said, Taiwan, come on in. Yeah. You know, uh, but I, I think what makes China particularly dangerous right now is it's in decline. I agree. The demographics are demographics are destiny for China. They're going to grow gray before they grow rich. They're going to fall into the middle income trap. They're no longer cheap labor. They're, no, they, they're just a lot of the things that fuel their growth are going away. Uh, they're going to see closing windows of opportunity, say with regard to Taiwan. And they're going to find that however much they clamp down on the internet, the modern world is porous to ideas mm -hmm. in a way that uh, they simply can't control. Autarky was, all right, was easier in the 1930s, intellectual as well as economic autarky. Well, and the, I think John's point, the, they're, they're cracking down on the private tech companies and they're really acting like they're instruments of the state. They're going to lose whatever entrepreneurial dynamism they had. But. Well, in, in, addition, in addition to the demographics, uh, President Xi is moving, <clears throat> he, moving away from the liberalism that helped China to grow, which is only going to speed up the decline. But the demographics yeah. don't factor as much when a world is connected like this. I mean, I but, just, China's, I, but China's I, disconnecting yeah, but they got, itself. But you, are you going to immigrate into China? It's fascinating to visit Shanghai. <laughs> it's not exactly an open, an open society. Well, yeah, but it's a, to visit Shanghai and go to VC meetings there, all the young people with U.S. accents that are over there, and to see Shanghai is to see a place that this the state did not plan this. The ability of people to innovate is staggering, mm -hmm. and I think we, I think we're going to be surprised. But isn't the heavy hand of Beijing going, coming down on Shanghai? It's coming down on Hong Kong. I think if if it were you'd see U.S. stock markets crashing because what's the biggest market? Apple sells a fifth of its iPhones in China. GM sells more cars in China than North America. 4,200 Starbucks in China on the way to tens of thousands. Well, it's not just the if, U.S. If they crack <clears throat> down, we're going to know it here, which makes me think we're overstating the crackdown. It's a pretty 
to look at it economically, to visit the cities there is to be staggered by the progress. But let me reburnish my pessimistic <laughs> credentials here. China is first, last, and always a Leninist state. And in a Leninist state, the power of the party is everything. And if it requires them to sacrifice prosperity, they'll sacrifice prosperity. And I, that's exactly what they're doing now. Yes. That's exactly what she's decided. Um, well, finally, we got to a pessimistic conclusion here. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Your reputation George, you're stands. wonderful. I mean, it, this is, the, you know, it, it's, just, it's just fun to go from this to this to this. I really thank you for joining us. You guys, we didn't even last get to question do sports, here, though. Comments? Yes. Yeah, well, I'll come back in baseball season, if there is, <laughs> if there is a baseball season. Don, anything else you want to add? No, it's just been an honor to be with George yeah. Will. As, 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 as you know, I very much admire your work, and I think you're probably the single most prominent voice for sanity in the English-speaking world today. Well, my first stop every morning is at Cafe Hayek. That only further enhances the truth of what I just said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank what you, guys. This, this is great great just a spectacular okay. George Will, thank you. We'll do it again. Uh, Thanks, author Bill. of a terrific book. And let's, yeah, let's do continue this conversation because we've, as usual, touched upon just a piece of what we ought to be talking about. So thanks for joining us in the Bill Walton Show. Been here with George Will, Don Bedreau, and John Tamney. And we're all hoping to come back and continue the conversation. Hope you'd enjoyed it. You can find us on all the major podcast platforms, YouTube and, uh, and Rumble. And I think we finally got a show that's not going to be pulled from YouTube. So this is a this is a very good thing, and uh, although we did predict their demise, <laughs> thank you, thank you for joining, and uh, we'll talk with you again real soon. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over a hundred episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our interesting people page. And send us your comments. We read everyone, and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.